Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Kay, and I'm a consultant and coach in the nonprofit sector. As you know, today we're here to delve into the report, Thrive As You Lead, a conversation on supporting Black women leaders in our community. This is one of many reports and several national, three national reports on this, this challenge specifically. So we know that this is a national problem. Four organizations in our region have come together to put on this event, the Washington Area Women's Foundation, which is the author of this report, giving together Philanthropy DMV and my organization, the Executive Sanctuary. And I wanna to stress to you that the explicit goal of all the organizations represented is to pursue racial equity and social justice. So I will briefly introduce each organization. So for more than a decade, I have facilitated the Executive Sanctuary, which is an ongoing program for nonprofit CEOs. As a peer learning community, each year we have a blend of three two-day in-person retreats, coaching, and Zoom meetings to advance organizational leadership. One of the most concerning things in our community in the past two years, we have had five African-American CEOs who had to leave their jobs because of board issues. Just gives me goosebumps to even say it. Giving Together is a local women's giving circle whose mission is to support women and families in need in the greater Washington area. They do this through an ongoing program of monetary grants and community service. Since its inception, Giving Together has raised over a million dollars and contributed countless hours of community service to improve the lives of women and their families. Since 1998, the Washington Area Women's Foundation has invested more than 17 million in the power of women and girls in the DMV. Through its commitment to grant making and advocacy, the Women's Foundation drives transformative change by amplifying the voices of women and girls of color. They collaborate with partners to influence policies, philanthropy, with a focus on gender and racial equity. And I'm sorry I'm reading this, but there's no other way I'm gonna get through it. <laughs> philanthropy DMV is a nonprofit membership organization comprised of over a hundred of the greater Washington region's foundations and corporate giving programs. Together, they learn, problem solve, and develop cross-sector solutions to achieve greater community impact. So that's it for the four organizations. Now let me introduce your interviewer, Marla Dean, and, your, uh, and, and Tamara Wilds Lawson, who is the CEO of the Women's Foundation, um, who is the author of the report. So Dr. Marla Dean is an award-winning education leader and an expert on the educational strategy. You can enjoy her TED Talk on the subject of two-generation policy and approaches, a pathway out of poverty. At the Greater Washington Community Foundation, Marla leads the $95 million Health Equity Fund. And she is currently the board chair of Philanthropy DM. DMV and a couple of other organizations. She'll be your interviewer. Tamara Wiles Lawson is the president and CEO, as I said, of the Washington Area Women's Foundation. She brings a wealth of knowledge and extensive experience in the non in nonprofit leadership and has been a CEO at more than one or organization. She was recently honored as one of Washington Business Journal's 2024. 2024 diverse leaders in business. Tamara's played a pivotal role in commem commemorating 25 years of serving women and girls in the region and releasing this groundbreaking report, marking the start of a long-term effort to support black women and gender expansive leaders. So let me say for the 60 people who are currently here, we are so grateful for everyone's participation today 
and for your commitment to racial equity and social justice. We'll have time for questions at the end, so please put them in the chat and I will monitor the chat and ask some questions when um, Marla and Tamara are finished. So thank you, and here we go. I'll turn it to you, Marla. Thank you, Heather. And hello, Doc, how are you doing today? Glad to see you and to be in conversation with you. I really want to start this conversation with um, everyone learning a little bit more about you and your journey to um, Washington Area Women's Foundation um, CEO. So can you tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got to um, this role? I sure can. Uh, before I do that, really, really happy to be here with um, both of you. Heather, have uh, known you for a long time, was uh, one of the leaders who, when running the Washington, D.C. office of the Posse Foundation, had the benefit of participating in uh, one of the sanctuary cohorts. So, so glad you're continuing to provide such a critical resource in the region. And Marla, who um, I have had the privilege of getting to know over the course of my year with the organization at about six months in, um, realized that I was seeing her in almost every space uh, outside of our internal meetings that I went to and then felt some kind of way if I showed up someplace and she wasn't there. So I just want you to know, Marla, that when I show up and you're someplace, I feel like that's where I'm supposed to be and I'm grateful for your leadership and, uh, and support. So my journey to this role, I want to start off by saying I've really had the privilege over the course of my career to do um, service-centered work and uh, to really focus on providing access to uh, everything from higher education to the support needed for uh, black and brown graduate students in the STEM fields to the work that I did early on in my career in national politics, making sure um, that black folks in particular were clear about the issues that were at stake. So there has been uh, a thread of providing access to underrepresented people in every single role that I have had. And specifically, my route to this role uh, really started with the Posse Foundation, which mm -hmm. was the culmination of many of the things I had done before then. It was really the perfect role for that time in my career. Uh, so I learned a lot about being a nonprofit leader in this region and subsequently joined the leadership team of Washington Nationals Philanthropies, which is the um, philanthropic arm of the Nationals baseball team. And there had my first exposure to um, leading grant making. And I was in that role during the pandemic where we really leaned into uh, food insecurity and uh, played a a pivotal role in helping to get resources and food to folks who needed it during the first couple of critical years um, of that pandemic. So those things in particular positioned me to um, understand both sides, right? I'm leading an intermediary now uh, with that thread that I discussed being at the core uh, of my desire to continue my servant leadership. So. Thank you for sharing that. And first, I just have to give a shout out to you as a fellow Ward 7 uh, resident and um, all the work you've done, uh, specifically in Ward 7, but across the city. I just have to acknowledge that. Um, I want to go deeper into how you came into uh, came to Washington Area Women's Foundation and really understand what made you decide to take this role had a great deal of respect for the organization, having known subsequent uh, a prior, prior board leaders and uh, being in the same leadership Greater Washington class with Jennifer Lockwood Shabbat. Um, so I was aware of the impact that the foundation had been making in the region for quite some time. 
I would say one of the most important things that drew me to the role was the organization's mission, which is investing in the power of women and girls of color through advocacy and grant making um, in a region where Black women and girls in particular, but women and girls of color overall, um, are disproportionately represented across all of the major issue inequities, mm -hmm. housing, education, healthcare, safety, employment and economic uh, security and opportunity, you name it. Unfortunately, um, and specifically, Marla, in our ward and our neighboring Ward 8, uh, when you read any of those statistics, we're often at the bottom. So this role represented an opportunity um, for me to be at the helm of a fabulous team that work day in and day out to push resources out to the organization's uh, on the ground that are um, serving the community and helping to ensure that the quality of life for women and girls mm -hmm. is what they deserve, which is much better um, than they have right now. Yeah, I, I appreciate you um, saying that because, and I always say this before I make this statement, um, I have a wonderful Black father, great relationship, a wonderful Black husband, great relationship, and a wonderful Black son, great relationship. But the needs of Black girls and women often don't get um, lift in this these conversations. And so it's so important that you um, center um, the fact that we're seeing great inequities and disparities with Black girls and Black women. And, um, so let's talk about what was the impetus for the um, Washington Area Women's Foundation creating this report? So thanks for that question. It's whenever I talk about the report, I always think it's critical that I um, position it in the very kind of organic way that it was born. A group of diverse leaders were at a social event and started talking about this disturbing trend and pattern of Black women leaders in this region leaving a you know, in serious tumult or navigating um, really difficult tenures as president and CEO or EDs of regional organizations. And, you know, Heather alluded to some of that. And by the end of that discussion, you know, it was clear, it really felt like uh, a crisis. It felt like something that needed to be interrogated. So mm -hmm. one conversation, turned into uh, a few follow-up meetings where mm -hmm. that original group decided to solicit help to find someone to really dig into this. And they contracted with KDF Strategies with whom we're still working to do the research um, because again, this didn't feel like a, a one-off, right? Just a, a hand, a couple of cases of uh, folks being unceremoniously removed or um, leaving in, uh, in chaos, it was happening at a pretty rapid rate. So fast forward and the wonderful research that, uh, KDF strategies helped, uh, put forward resulted in creating an environment where the 30 plus black women and black gender expansive leaders felt safe sharing their experience in anonymous interviews. And the report resulted from that. So the report and the preceding research was an answer to a call that this small group put out. And I like to start with that origin story because it really was so simple. Mm -hmm. And it's something that any of us could do, right? It didn't require... Um, you know, a, a major uh, convening, right? Uh, with folks on a dais having a lofty conversation. It, it took a group of concerned leaders who were having an honest dialogue about a problem. They uh, reached out to discovered experts that helped them really dig in. And now here we are. 
Yeah, I, I think I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you for just one second, Marla, and to say that the chat is disabled, so you'll need to put your questions in the Q and A. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um. So yeah, I think that you talk about um the origin story, and I think it's so important that um it is rooted in a real um experience that people were having at that time, and and really talking about that. Um, the report itself has 10 themes. Um, what important findings do you want to lift from those themes? So for the purpose of this discussion, I actually want to lift two okay. that um, I normally don't. Typically, <laughs> um, I go straight into um, expectations, which is one of the one of the themes, uh, you know, I, I talk about uh, wellness uh, and I wanted to do something different today. And that's to talk about donor relationships, particularly because of who is, mm -hmm. you know, who is, who's responsible for this discussion happening today. I wanna to talk about donor relationships and I wanna talk about resisting scarcity. So, all of the themes were critically important and again um, came from data captured as a result of the anonymous interviews that we conducted. I think starting with donor relationships, some of the language that I, I pulled directly from the report were phrases like um, entrenched power dynamics, mm -hmm. right? Um, an exclusive, predominantly white, affluent giving community. And uh, a word I added is that the philanthropic space in this region is very insular, right? I, so I, I'm a native Washingtonian and feel very comfortable saying that DC is a special place. And I mean that in good ways and bad. Um, and it is actually more of a town right? It's a small community of folks. And when you account for those who are, are running nonprofit organizations that serve people in the region, it's even smaller. Yeah. And so I wanted to start by talking about donor relationships because I think it's, it's one of those things that everybody assumes nonprofit leaders are kind of navigating the same experiences and environments. And what this report and my own lived experience um, demonstrate is that that is not the case. So often, I just dropped one of my earpieces. Can you all still hear me? Yes, we okay. can. Mm -hmm. um, often there is a real uh, challenge that nonprofit leaders experience as they uh, are trying to figure out how to navigate some of the unwritten rules of donor engagement. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm gonna center my privilege here and say that I, as a native Washingtonian who chose to come back here after college, um, I had a, I wouldn't say built in network, but I had a starter network. Mm -hmm. Um, with which to work. And that combined with my political experience meant that there were contacts that I could lean into as I started my journey. So many, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll offer that most Black women who are nonprofit leaders are not starting with that base. Mm -hmm. And so they are attempting to build relationships and try to figure out how to navigate, as I said, a highly resourced community that have their own way um, of moving. And donor relationships are difficult for, I think, all nonprofit leaders, full stop. There are layers of difficulty. Um, on top of that, that Black women and Black gender expansive leaders experience. And when that intersects with class, um, and when that intersects with uh, 
being considered an outsider, right? Because I also, um, to be frank, was am a product of uh, the private school system here, mm -hmm. right? Which meant that was a talking point early on in my tenure. Mm -hmm. I was able to use with folks, right? To break the ice. And um, I have heard stories and have experienced myself, even with the privileges that I brought to the role, how leaders have walked into rooms and folks at foundations have assumed they were their assistant's assistant. Uh, I have heard stories about um, how it has taken three or four times longer to get in front of donors for Black women leaders um, than their predecessors. I have um, heard stories about um, folks being stonewalled, just unable to access uh, the very people that are at the core of their organization's survival. And so I wanted to start there because it's not really something I have talked about very much publicly, um, but I'll return to the one piece I said, and then I'll move on to resisting scarcity. When I talked about the region being special, there is so much wealth in this region. And um, there is what I, what I will call a, a preciousness with which those resources and that wealth um, translates into giving. And that's actually a great segue into resisting scarcity. Yes. Yes. Um, so the report in the resisting scarcity theme starts by really talking about how um, the, the culture of scarcity within philanthropy in the region makes it difficult for Black women uh, leaders to collaborate, right? And I actually want to bypass that and go straight to what I think is more of a systemic issue, mm. which is um, that Within philanthropy, again, I'll say writ large, nonprofit leaders are often expected to do more with less. I think that is a shared experience. Yes. What I will say about Black women and Black gender expansive leaders experience um, with scarcity is that there is an almost unspoken expectation that it's okay for us to struggle because we should be used to it. And so um, that is a statement, again, based in lived experience and based in you know, what we heard from the leaders that we interviewed um, and what I've heard outside of this report uh, for years, right? So while the sector in the region has made some gains around scarcity at the systemic level, for example, really leaning into multi-year grants, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's been quite helpful. Um, and they have focused on removing some of the barriers to um, access for organizations uh, by simplifying the, uh, the proposal and report process, right? It mm -hmm. looks different than it did 12 or 13 years ago. And there's been intentionality around that and, and that's great. Um, but, but overall, I think the sector needs to have a really hard and important conversation about what it views as investing in leaders that are led by black women and women of color in a way that they can truly sustain. Um, and in a way that is not punitive to leaders who want their teams, for example, to be paid above a livable wage, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Who want the communities that they are serving um, to, have the 
resources for their families that are not just hovering above the bare minimum, right? Their children deserve to have exposure to college campuses. Their children uh, deserve to be in classes in beautiful buildings. Their children deserve to have access to, um, to therapists on a regular basis, right? Their families deserve more um, than just a standard corner store, right? Or B level grocery store. They deserve to have access to six grocery stores, which anyone living on Capitol Hill, with which you know we're in close proximity, have that, right? So there's a difference um, when you're looking at a nonprofit leader who is uh, working to serve those folks. There's a difference between believing that the bare minimum is enough and looking at your own life as a funder and seeking to provide resources to these organizations so that we can ensure that the folks they're serving can begin moving in a direction that their kids may eventually have some of the same resources that you have. And that's a, that's a long journey, but that should be the goal. Um, and so there's an overarching challenge and it trickles down into the resources that the folks were serving, you know, that they're able to access and it definitely impacts uh, leaders, Marla, and, and makes it an environment where there's just this expectation that they're supposed to be on the struggle bus at all times. That ease is not something they are supposed to know as leaders. Um, and that is really problematic um, and really um, damaging and harmful and contributes to significant burnout. Yes. Wow, you put a lot on the table and I um, really wanna thank you for that. I mean, I think there's been, um, Bridge Pan put out a report a number of years about black leaders and um, the hidden kind of curriculum, that's a term we use in education around um, fundraising and resource development. And I think it is even particularly cute for black women. And then I think about when you talk about the um, kind of scarcity mindset, um, that, you know, this is a, a, a wealthy, um, um, area in many ways it has great disparities and great gaps, but there's still a lot of wealth. And I'm not a native, native Washingtonian. And I often tell people, you know, Washington DC has 700,000 residents, give or take, and a budget of over 22 billion. The city I come from has 700,000 residents and a budget of 6.5 billion. So we don't have to lean into a scarcity mindset if we just have the will and desire um, to think differently about this. And then lastly, um, we're seeing this with um, maternal health, that there's this belief that black women don't feel pain and can endure high love, higher levels yeah. of pain. Yeah. So when you talk about, you know, that Black women should just be comfortable on the struggle bus and that's what's wrong with that, like we have to really push back at um, those kind of um, beliefs and mindsets. So I want to, Marla, just one quick thing about the, the some of the systemic changes that, that I'm hoping we're, we're moving towards, there are some uh, longstanding institutions, funding institutions that give large gifts. Right. They are anomalies. Right. Most of the foundations that are giving gifts are giving at a level that, that um, make it difficult for all of the nonprofits who are seeking support to really sustain. When you talk about an ROI on what you or your development staff, if you're lucky enough to have them, the time that you're putting in um, to completing a proposal for five or $10,000 um, in a funding community that could do more is a contributing factor to that. And I just wanted to make sure I named that. 
I'm so glad you named it. And that's such an important issue, especially with both of us being in philanthropy and um, and having those who are on um, sponsoring this event. This is incredibly important. I often think, wow, a lot is being asked of an organization for 10,000. They might've spent 10,500 trying to pull this report together and do all the work. So we just really need to be mindful of the ask and um, and what we really need to make the decisions we need to make. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and we can look to our peers in Boston. We can look to our peers in New York. Mm. We can look to our peers in Atlanta. Like there are other regions that I just think do a better job. Thank you, thank you. Um, so were there, um, emerging themes that did not make this report or that are threads that are worthy of maybe further exploration in the future? I just wonder. Yeah, the one in particular, which is the diversity of experience across our respondents, right? We were able to get in front of emerging leaders, folks that are mid-career uh, and folks who, you know, are considered veterans, right? Are um, looking towards retirement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a lot of differentiation between what they named as needs. Mm -hmm. And I think we absolutely need to interrogate um, how, depending on where you sit in that spectrum, um, what you require from your board, what you require from, um, you know, from your teams, what you need from peers, it just, it can look very, very different. And here's a, a specific example. Some of the emerging leaders, you know, folks who have um, been in their roles, let's say for five or less years, talked about really wanting cohorts right, really wanting um, a collection of their peers that they could uh, lean into or and or wanted access to uh, mid-career folks, right, and more senior level folks. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, the senior level folks were like, I don't need to be in another session sitting in a circle, like I have done, I've been there, I've done that, that I, I need, um, what I need are resources that I have the agency to direct how I want to direct them. Because I've been in this, you know, role or roles like it for 25, 30 years, and have never had the benefit um, of, mm. of that, those ownership rights over funding in the way that I believe I should because I'm struggling so much, right? So I need an infusion that invests directly in my leadership so that I get to do with it what I want for the organization and for the folks we're serving. Uh, and so I think that's something we will continue to pay attention to, just the diversity of, of needs that were named while, um, while we were doing the research. Yeah, so we often say that being Black is not a monolith. And so what I hear you saying is that even within, while there are common themes and connective tissue, that you know, being a Black woman um, leader of a nonprofit is also not a monolith. Mm -mm. So I want to spend some time on infrastructure and boards. Uh, many gathered here are board chairs or sit on boards. What do they need to know and understand? So I'm going to start with something that will sound simple, but I think it is one of the most important takeaways from our conversation today. Um, I think it's critical that board chairs and that boards assume and recognize that their organization's leader is going to experience additional challenges and barriers. Just start with that baseline assumption. And that assumption is rife with all kinds of, um, uh, what's the best word? Denial, there's a, there's a good word. Um, 
And so what should be easy gives way to the human tendency to kind of poke holes in it as a premise or, you know, look inward and say, well, I, you know, I had similar experiences, so surely it can't be that bad. It is in fact that bad. So our respondents are saying that reports that predated ours are saying that you named the Bridgepan report. Um, the Miss Foundation has done relevant work that names it, right? Um, so if we can get to the point where we can start there, right, just assuming as a board that you're the leader of the organization that you are supporting um, is going to face more barriers and challenges, then that enables you, once you've reconciled that fact, to be more intentional about what's setting them up for success if they're new or supporting them if they've been there in the role for a while, you know, what that looks like both internally and externally. An example, um, externally, all of a sudden a conversation about who is going to accompany the ED to a pitch meeting is more intense, right? And you gotta be more strategic about who's in the room. Um, when you account for the level of um, bias and racism that's going to be in that room with you. Mm. So what can you do, right? Are there some cases where the ED shouldn't be even be in the room, right? Should there be two or three of you who go in and know that you can be great ambassadors or stewards because you're clear, you've done the research, you know about the environment that you're going into, right? And there are plenty of environments where the values of the organizations are aligned, but the mindset of the folks that you're going to pitch to don't necessarily track, right? Um, so there wouldn't be a conflict in taking resources from the organization, but you've gotta be uh, strategic about how you engage them. And then internally, once you've accepted that premise that your ED or CEO or president is going to um, experience more challenges, you can also assume that you're going to need help recognizing the organization's um, growth areas and your own growth areas. And every single member of a board including the board members of color, come to the roles with their lived experience and their own set of biases, right? And so you would ask for help for anything else. Mm -hmm. So enlist the support of one of several fantastic DEI, ready, whatever acronym you want to use, um, focused consulting firms. And I'll name two that I've engaged with, Wayfinding Partners, Front Frontline Solutions, um, are two that have done magnificent work um, within the last decade and are still going strong. They will come and help you make sure that you are living the, um, the values of the organization and that you are providing a supportive uh, culture for your leader. And then the last thing I would say, um, I have been both guilty of this and I've also been uh, on the receiving end of it as a leader. You get in board meetings, there's so much to talk about, right? So many things to check off your list that often you forget to just ask your ED how they are doing. And when you ask them that, and you've already reconciled that first assumption, you can listen more carefully and maybe hear what they're not saying or believe them when they say they are struggling in a certain area and, um, and allow them the space to make it a safe space for them to share that. Vulnerability was another one of the themes, right? Um, but it takes work and often help to be able to listen 
actively without judgment to a black woman leader when she's talking about her or their experience. So those are the, I think it was three, three <laughs> or four things that come to mind um, when I think about specific things that, that, that boards can do. Um, and you can ask that general question, how are you doing? And you can also say, hey, I, I, you know, I read the report. Is any of this happening to you? And if it is, like, what can I do better or how can I help? Um, but seeing them and, you know, asking the question, which is a form of validation. Yeah, you left um, so many things that we could actually talk about singularly in a, um, a session. Um, I really think about um, many of the things that you talked about, um, you know, creating a safe, safe space, vulnerability and its connection to being perceived as competent or not competent and what that means for um, Black women um, in particular. I mean, they're um, the role of um, Black board members in this space and how they might project or not their experiences yeah. um, to this situation. And um, I mean, it's just so much. It's so many threads there um, to um, go down. But I, I think this, you give us a good understanding of a place to start um, and to really think through um, these issues. So um, I thank you. What do you hope um, people will learn and do um, with this report? So an easy thing to do is share it and just make people aware of it. I think one of the things uh, we are have been most excited about is that it has been resonant outside of the region and outside of the sector. And so if something, you know, if there's something in particular that you connect with, share it in your personal network, in your professional network, uh, in your semi-professional network, through your sorority, like whatever that looks like. Um, and then I think, and I've heard that some organizations are doing it, use it as a tool of inquiry internally, mm -hmm. right? The, the board can use it if you are um, an intermediary and you want to, um, you're curious about how many of your grantee partner leader, grantee partner organizations leaders see themselves, you can use it in that manner. Um, and I think most important, it is yet another piece of evidence that can help all of us dispel this notion that every leader is having the same experience. It is hard being a nonprofit leader, full stop. Again, it just is. Um, and this region being a nonprofit leader in an election cycle is, <laughs> We could have a whole conversation about that. <laughs> um, but using it to say, you know, it it is in fact a, it is a data point, right? Like, so you can refer to it when you're in conversations with folks about the particular challenges that Black women and Black gender expansive leaders um, that they have and that they, that they confront. Um, and I think, the last piece is use it as inspiration to invest in more Black women, Black gender expansive, women of color led organizations. Uh, we can do we can do better. There are organizations that are in need. Um, one of my favorite Leadership Greater Washington uh, classmates, Rachel Kronowitz, always talks about the importance of investing local. They're not mutually exclusive. You can give nationally to your favorite cause, um, but look at the balance, right? And use this report to direct where some of your funds are, are going. Um, because I can tell you a, a couple of years after the uh, Miss Foundation first started talking about this uh, in one of their pocket change reports, we are still at a place where we represent 50% of the population, but less than 2% of all philanthropic giving is going to support women and girls. 
And a fraction of that goes to support women and girls of color. And I would submit a fraction of that goes to support organizations led by black women and women of color. So, you know, that is one way to put your money where your mouth is. And obviously we are constantly looking, we meaning the project is constantly looking for large scale investments to help us move towards the resources um, and the recommendations that our respondents made that we are, um, we want to honor. Thank you. Um, so Lisa, I often come back to education examples because it's what I consider my first professional identity. Um, Lisa Del Pitt has a book called um, Other People's Children, and she talks about something called the silenced dialogue. And that's at the point where, you know, people stop talking because they really know they're not being listened to. So I really appreciate you really starting with the conversation around denial and listening and listening closely to not only what's being said, but what's not being said. Are there other um, actions boards need to play close attention to? Um, what other um, actions do boards need to be engaged in in order to really give um, Black women and Black um, gender expansive um, people um, a fighting chance at success? So one thing that comes to mind, and it goes back to the scarcity point, uh, is there a professional development line in the budget for the organization? And as a board, will you support adding one if there isn't, or um, infusing an existing line with enough for a leader to actually work with a an executive coach so they can you know, sharpen the skills that they need to continue leading the organization successfully. That's one specific example because often they're like folks scoff at, there's this divide between corporate spaces where there is a, um, a surplus of uh, accoutrement, right? Of just, wonderful things folks can take advantage of. And then on the other side are, again, nonprofit leaders on the struggle bus, right? Who, if they bring up, and, and this is, I believe, typical. I don't know if you'll, um, if you'll agree with me here, Marla. You know, I found often when I talked about professional development um, funding for the organization, I was talking about my staff. I wanted them to have, right? Like, they need I they are they want to grow as professionals, right? So EDs, presidents, CEOs need the same, mm -hmm. right? And so um no one is suggesting that a you know an organization with a 1.1 million dollar budget should have access to the same resources that a five, you know, like a, a Fortune 500 company has. But there are particular pieces that should be standard for leaders. And at the regional level, it's very possible um, for boards to support and help find funding to support. And there are funders who will invest in that, who will invest in infrastructure. Um, I've been the beneficiary of that. I was when I was at the Passy Foundation, and I'm still reaping the rewards. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a that is one line that um, dovetails directly with some of the recommendations that the leaders that we surveyed said they would really appreciate. And the bo boards have agency in that, right? And because the scarcity model can make some boards think, well, you don't, you know, do you really have time to be gone one day a week, four times? to go participate in the leadership sanctuary or to go to this particular uh, retreat experience. I don't know if you really have time for that, right? Can, can you, can we really support you getting the certificate? And, and I, I, I have had 
so many conversations with leaders over the years about um, about that. It's demoralizing and it's a wasted opportunity for boards to really invest in the folks um, that they are supposed to be supporting and helping to guide. Yeah, I really wanna talk about um, the report outlines a number of recommendations, but I, um, before you start to speak to some of those recommendations, I really also wanna to speak to this notion of when you are in space with other leaders, you learn some things that um, many um, Black women don't come into um, the sector knowing. I mean, I think about um, learning about contracts and who actually had a contract and who didn't have a contract. Like that was eye opening to me. Um, and so you just get so much background information yeah. that could have positioned you differently, could have had you enter yeah. or circumstance different, um, that you just don't even have any idea that those are conversations you need to be aware of. So with that, can you speak to the report's um, recommendations and, and some of the recommendations outlined in the report? I can, and I'll, I'll just put a finer point on that last piece. Leadership is isolating. It just, it, that's one of the things that, that makes it difficult. If you are, I believe, leading in a healthy way, you understand that you're not there um, to be friends with your staff. You are there to respect them and hopefully friendship will develop, but that's not the goal, right? And um, I remember seeing, um, you know, wonderful relationships bloom and, uh, and this, my, the team that I was leading really um, come together uh, in ways that I knew would be counterproductive if I participated in, right? And that's just on the social side. Uh, in terms of leadership growth, to your point, it really helps to be able to have candid conversations and discrete conversations with your peers to say, like, I've had two or three people transition in the last 90 days, and I am feeling overwhelmed by that. Like, what did you do? I heard you say in the last session that happened to you. Like, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm a terrible leader? Does it, it's like, is it a cyclical thing? What is it? Uh, and so that's just another reason why why that kind of investment in um, in whoever is leading the organization is is critical. It's and I think it really is the responsibility of the organization and of the board yeah. um, to encourage it and to fund it. I funded my own in in previous roles and and taken the hit, and it proved to be well worth it. But it shouldn't have been something I had to do. Right. I'll just name that plainly. Um, as far as recommendations, uh, there are two or three that I will highlight. Um, and I'll also name that after the release of the report in the fall, before the end of the year, we also hosted two or three focus groups with the same set of respondents that were all about recommendations. And uh, pushing into those and hearing more about um, what folks really meant when they talked about it, like what they saw, if they were, you know, dreaming big and, and coming up with bold ideas, what would that look like? And so there are some that I feel like are low hanging fruit, which are convenings, bringing leaders together to do some of what we just talked about. And I'll, I'll put in a plug for um, a convening if you're interested, um, and we are having our first public in-person convening on the 25th um, mm -hmm. here in DC. And I'm really excited about that. But folks said like they wanted a space that they didn't lead, but that the issues they talked about could be discussed. Um, and there would be an opportunity for other folks in the philanthropic space to hear um, some of the challenges and, and opportunities. So that's low hanging fruit. In addition to our resource guide, um, that is something, that's a, a small thing that I think can have an Im, a, a huge impact. It's been up on our website for a couple of months now. And that was our way of honoring 
the people and organizations that have been helping to provide uh, support and infrastructure for Black women and Black gender expansive leaders for some time. And we wanted to name that and, and direct people there. So the convenings, the resources, I believe are kind of low hanging fruit. There's ongoing pieces that leaders named like actual trainings for them and for their boards. That's somewhere in the middle. And then there were what I consider to be more bold ideas. Uh, so really investing in leaders with, um, with grants and with pools of money that they can direct as they see fit. Some would likely direct it to their team, likely direct it to their overall budget, but they would have the discretion while others would, if there isn't a budget line for uh, leadership development, they might use it for that, right? So what do grants, direct grants to leaders that would enable them to really have a no strings attached sabbatical experience, yeah. right? Yeah. Sabbaticals as we know them in the yeah. traditional sense, number one, they fly by. I remember yeah. taking a month, the only sabbatical I've ever taken, which was a month. And I was so excited about it and so grateful for it. And I blinked my eyes and it was time for me to be back in the office, right? Um, I was lucky that I had one that did not necessitate me like writing a report about what I did. It was a true sabbatical, but I, I want what we want and what many of the leaders uh, talked about is, you know, what does a, a, a well-resourced with limited expectations sabbatical experience look like? Right. So anyway, direct grants to leaders. The other bold idea, which is not new, but, you know, this group and the report has helped us um, name that leaders really want it. Healing spaces. Right. What does it look like to fund a true retreat experience where there are options for folks to be fully present and talk about their work? Or the exact opposite of that. Mm -hmm. They just want and need a chance to rest and revive. Um, and often, and I'm guilty of this, I'll be like, I just, I need a space where I can go and really focus on the big picture, right? And I do need that. That is not the same thing as a healing space. Those are two very different Two very different things. Right. Um, and we are talking about the second space. What does it look like to heal? What does it look like to build community? What does it look like to rest um, and, and invest in the, those experiences, knowing that that has a direct correlation to the successful leadership of an organization? I've been using this example, you know, it's like um, like a Black woman's golf trip. And I know there are, the Black women golfers who are listening to this are probably frowning at me. But there is this disconnect between the um, subsidized, high-end rejuvenation trips that men, primarily white men, are encouraged to take, right? So that they can bond with each other and bond with clients, right? Um, what does it look like if we use some of that energy as inspiration for the high end environments our EDs should have access to, to rest, right? Um, and to rejuvenate and be better versions of themselves when they return to work. They also deserve that. And I'll offer, have likely done twice the amount of work that folks in the other example have done. Um, so we are deserving. And some of the bold recommendations of our leaders, they didn't name that explicitly, but that's what I got from it. Like they were talking about need and where that landed for me is that is what they, we deserve. 
uh, we are again, working exceedingly hard and doing a lot with very little. And so why anybody thinks that that is a winning model and that that's going to have the um, have anything other than a d disastrous result, uh, like I don't, I don't know how you can make that make that make sense. And the lack of opportunities for folks to um, for folks to heal and be still and build community contribute to burnout and something we haven't named but is named in the wellness theme of the report. It it has physiological impacts, right? Right, mental health impacts. Um, there have been too many stories of leaders across different sectors, Black women in particular, losing their lives, right, as a result of um, the accumulation of um, of stress. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I was in grad school, I um, interviewed a number of Black women superintendents, and then. 10 years um, after I interviewed them, um, I was amazed at how many of them had actually died. Um, and it was eye-opening. Um, it was actually one of the reasons why I decided I didn't want to become a superintendent um, was that reality. I um, really appreciate you raising all these issues. I, when I was a nonprofit leader, you know, I had a, a staff member say to me, now, Dr. Dean, like, chill. I just need you to understand that rest is revolutionary. And I had never heard that term and didn't know what she was talking about. She could have been speaking French to me. <laughs> so you um, really leaning to rest and wellness um, and well-being is really um, important here. I think we are at a point um, before we come full back for closing remarks to start to take some questions, Heather, from um, the chat or from the Q&A. Um, but before I do that, is I there have... any point, um, Tamara, that you really want to make before we go to questions from the audience? No, I'm looking forward to the to the questions. I do. I will name that the book Rest is Resistance is on our resource guide. So I yeah. encourage people to go check it out. Trisha Hershey, Hersey. I didn't have your resource guide at that time, so thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay, I will give you a couple of questions, but I'll tell you, quite honestly, it's been very hard to sit still through this conversation. I mean, I, I want I want to scream. I want to jump up and down. I want to reinforce your points. I want to say, yes, this is happening over and over and over again. With the leaders that are in Executive Sanctuary, the whole issue of every issue that you talk about has come up. And I actually want to say that I think that this report needs to be required, not nice to, mm -hmm. but required reading for every board member and certainly for every grant maker we can get um, to read it. But for every board member, it should be required reading. It is so critical to understand these issues. So I'm gonna try and get off this soapbox, but I'm it's a it's one I feel so passionate about. Um so here is the first question. You mentioned that Boston, New York, and Atlanta are doing a better job of making things easier for grantees, i.e., only asking for what's needed. Do you have examples of any of any specific organizations or recommendations? Oh, I let me clarify. When I talked about those other regions, I meant the average gifts that funding institutions in particular are giving. I would never wade into um, outside of my expertise and research anything other than that. I have had experience within nonprofits. Um, you know, and in some of my grant making colleagues in those regions who scoff at the average gift from this region. So that was a specific reference to mm -hmm. um, gift size. Okay, great, thank you. And another one was how do you balance, and this is so tough, 
the need to address the racism and bias in the room, and at the same time, really respect and honor your ED or CEO as a strong, smart, and capable leader. I think when you enter any conversation with a, a leader from a space of um, authentic curiosity and and you are direct, it, it, you, you can't go wrong. Um, so I think one of the gifts that the report provides is I was sent this report or I've read this report and you know, it is important to me as a board member to do what I feel like is my job, which is support you. And I'm, I am curious if you are ever open and that's, and that's a, a, a second little, uh, that's one A. Just because you ask the question doesn't mean the ED right. will be ready in that moment in real time to answer, but that also doesn't, that shouldn't preclude you from asking. Right. I want to support you. Read this report. You know, I'd be curious to know if you, if you've had a chance to read it. If you not, if you haven't, I encourage you to. If any of it resonated with you, and if there is, you know, anything I slash the board um, can do to be to be supportive, and leave it there. Even that will be amazing because that's not getting done. No. Um, Heather, another question was what do donors... But before you go to that, Heather, I just want to yeah. on that point. You know, um, Tamara, you said earlier, like board members going to certain pitch meetings and maybe not even the CEO or ED going. And I just think about, you know, what that means for a Black woman and gender expansive leader to know that their very um, presence could be a hindrance to resource development for organization. I mean, that's a lot to take in and to endure. And yet I know that every um, one of us have had those moments and known that that was taking place, um, that your presence was a hindrance to um, resource development. So I just think that when you talk about the report and asking that question, and also just recognizing, but it has very real um, um, impact on Black women leaders um, knowing that these things are happening right before them and yet um, are largely out of their control. Thanks for that. Yeah. Marla. It is, it's devastating. And it's, it's you know, it's, it's a reality. It's very much a reality. I, I mean, I, I watched it myself where um, a black woman, a black woman leader has gone into an organization where the previous ED had long relationships with some of the donors. I mean, went to summer um, retreats with them, went on yoga retreat, whatever. And you can't, you can't just step into that role. You can't. So. And another question was, what can donors do to break down the entrenched power imbalance? Is there anything donors can do? The first thing that came to mind is talk to your peers, right? Use your interest in wanting to be a good, um, a good steward of your own funds, right? In service of others to talk to your peers um, about what you heard in this discussion, what you've read that resonated with you in the report. I think the other thing donors can do is um, some of their own research um, to of their of their own portfolio, as I mentioned earlier, like what's the what's the balance of your giving? And is it time for you to shake it up a little bit and plainly to diversify it? Um, I think, that first piece is where I started because uh, if you are a donor at a certain level, you definitely have access to other donors who are highly resourced. And it is 
less likely that the leaders that we are talking to, talking about, and that we spoke to for the report are gonna, they're not gonna have the same level of access, right? So what is some of the um, pounding of the table or advocacy that you can do behind closed doors? Um, what are the hard conversations you can have without those leaders being present to say, you know, it's, or have, when was the last time you funded a fill in the blank organization that's that's led by a black woman or black uh, uh, expansive leader? What what is what does that look like? So there is work to be done in network, for lack of a better phrase, that I think is important. And you know, in those conversations where your EDs are not present as board members, back to board members, whether intentionally or not. Just make sure your talking points are tight and that you are um, that you are really advocating for and and um, what's the word uh, highlighting their and celebrating their leadership, whether they're sitting next to you in the boardroom or not. What does it look like to validate their competency? Right, you may know that you're there because a decision was made that that was that was smarter. But you need to be dropping their name and dropping their um, their talent and their contributions and their value throughout that conversation, so that you can plant the seed of the relationship that that ED can then pick up. And is there anything that you can think of that Black women leaders can can do to fortify themselves to face this funding landscape, I, I, or even this landscape in general? Um, that the question was for funding specifically, but what I what I notice so often is the safety issue is so paramount that leaders don't feel safe for saying what they need to say or acting in a way that they feel they should act because of what they're facing with their boards, et cetera. So is there anything that you can think of to for Black leaders to fortify themselves in this arena? I'll just say the first two things that came to mind, and um, Marla's probably going to laugh at the first one. Take your PTO. Uh -huh. Like that's a very simple, don't buy into that. What you shouldn't have rollover days. If you're in it, like if, if you have them, use them um, and do your best to truly unplug and, and take care of yourself. That is, that is simple. And that is, uh, that was a very um, institutionally centered answer, but you have it. So use it. And then the second thing that came to mind is if you have a within your network more established and experienced leaders ask them for help mm -hmm. and you trust them ask them for help if you don't which some of the emerging leaders who were uh, respondents in the report said you know i'm struggling like i i don't be creative in looking for folks um, that, you know, you may not, I, I have a, and I'm speaking from personal experience here, I have a habit of uh, compartmentalizing, right? So my professional network is one thing. And then I got my friends who, you know, I act like we're still sophomores in college and forget that they're, they own their own businesses and they're, you know, attorneys and their CPAs are doing all these wonderful things and I don't ask them for anything, right? Outside of when are we meeting for brunch, right? When I'm in church, I'm sitting next to people who have known me for a long time and are invested in my success. I've never asked them for anything. So if you don't have a support network that is right in front of you, then take a step back and look at places that you can, um, you can search for them and ask for help. And I guarantee mm -hmm. that the folks that you have established any kind of rapport with, if they are not in a position to help you and support you, they have 
access to other people who would do it in a heartbeat. Um, but you got to be willing to go kind of outside of your comfort zone in, bo in both examples. If you have a network, don't ask for help late. Like if you need it, and 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 here's here is a here is an assumption for any black women and black gender expansive leaders of nonprofits listening to this. Don't let imposter syndrome mm -hmm. make you believe that you are the only person experiencing challenges in your leadership role. You are not. There are just universal nonprofit leader challenges, right? Um, and so don't let that be an impediment to finding your people, finding your mentors, setting up a, a kitchen cabinet. Um, you are not alone. There are people who want you to succeed. Often they are on your board. Sometimes they're not, right? But you do have access to people who will help you. You just, in some cases, have to be creative to identify them. Marla, is there anything uh, you would you would push back on or you would add to that? Um, no, I think you give a really good um, answer to that. I, I just think about, um, <laughs> I was look, thinking about Kimberly Crenshaw and her, term um that she point intersectionality mm -hmm. i was specifically thinking about in this conversation black expansive um gender expansive leaders yeah and every time you add one more, more of those intersections how much more complicated yeah. difficult, challenging yeah. this um can be and um you know the only thing i would add if i had anything to add is that because we are socialized in um, a system that values some people much more than others, um, even if we're people of color, we have our own learning journey to help support leaders because we also take in those messages and sometimes internalize them. So this is a complicated issue on so many um, levels. Um, and the reason why I raise that is because people say, well, you know, they got a black board chair, they got a black this. Yeah, but it's more complicated than yeah. just having a black person um, in a role. Um, it's really about the learning journey of the board itself and the yeah. individuals on that board, too, in order to be able to successfully and effectively support a leader. Yeah, yeah, thank you that, for that. that. That question, you know, came up even in a different way about, you know, what recommendations do you have to bring people who are kind of not um in the in the groove and understand this in any way? Um how how you bring them on your side. And I think you have addressed that. Um, in many in many of your comments, um, and I just want to raise it one more time: Is there anything else that you'd want to say about how we bring people over, how we help people see? I I mean, to me, just seeing the reports, but it's if someone's entrenched, it's really hard, and those people need actually to get away. You know, it's like we yeah. want to put we want to put our effort on the people who are on our side, who are maybe on the fence and need a little bit of support. But the people who are way over, we do we really want to put our effort there? We want to we want to build our allyship. I think the uh, I appreciate that framing, Heather, and I think the folks who um, have not had access to information who may be on, you know, maybe on the fence, there's this, there's a sweet spot there, right? Oh. Um, I, I wanted, I think it's important to name that as a, a Black woman leader and a person that was in graduate school forever, for whom the intersections that Marla named were kind of at the core of my, um, humanities research, I, I got to a point where I realized that there was an expectation 
that I was supposed to have all the answers mm -hmm. and right answer all the questions regardless of mm -hmm. my mood whatever is going on in my life that I'm just supposed to be ready to dive into these really complex to Marla's point um and nuanced issues so for folks who are want to be curious want to be more curious folks who are on the fence folks who are are, are terrified because it like these are mm -hmm. this whole conversation it this is hard this is hard stuff we're talking about right and so what i would first encourage folks to do um is put some energy into reading you know my husband says um and it gets on my nerves when he says it but it's it's true google is free right look up some of the authors that we've talked about some of the concepts and see what comes back to you right those algorithms work too it's not just the awful stuff that works um see what comes back to you there are lists out there for what allyship looks like right what what is what 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 is your short list of articles you can work through what's your short list of books that you can read um and and start there you know simple things like understanding what gender expansive means mm -hmm. you know uh what it what 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 is DEI? Mm -hmm. What does that actually look like in the context of um, uh, board governance and in the context of organizational culture? Uh, use the report as a guide for that. There were terms, we threw around all kinds of terms in that report. You can use that and outline some of the things that you want to know more about and do some of your own um, investigation so that the women of color in your orbit um, are not being held responsible for doing the intellectual labor before you've put some of your own effort forward. I think that that is really important because I can tell you, um, I am so proud to be who I am and be in this skin and live the life that I live. And many elements of it are extremely exhausting. And um, most times I'm ready and I'm prepared to have these conversations, but there are times when I'm not, and that has to be okay. Great points. Thank you so much. Well, we are coming to the close. I will say that I, I only wish there were 100,000 people on this call um, and that really that all of the white population really listens to this at a very heartfelt level, really ingesting some of the incredibly important points that you both have made. So um, I encourage everyone, there are, there are several other reports on this. The Nonprofit Quarterly just did put, did put a whole magazine together on this topic, which is absolutely beautiful and very special, but at the same time, hard hitting. So I encourage you to keep, as, as Tamara said, keep up your research, keep speaking up, keep t letting people know that these resources exist and we have a lot of work to do, as you well know, in this very difficult political environment. And Heather, can I just- Yeah, um, sure, please. Give I was a closing kind of um, <laughs> <laughs> remark around this. Um, so first, um, Tamara, thank you so much um, for the work you do. Thank you so much for um, this report. And um, I, we don't necessarily have to have 100,000 people on here but we can get a hundred thousand shares, right? Like just share it, send it everywhere, you know, post it when we come out because it is recorded and we will be sharing it. And then um, <clears throat> in addition to that, Philanthropy DMV will be offering some guidance and some um, discussions around what just came out of the um, court, court of Appeals, the 11th, the 11th Circuit about supporting um, specific funding 
to um, Black people and you know race-based funding. So we don't want anybody to retreat or to feel like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Um, there's going to be more conversations, more support, and more guidance around that court ruling to really help people understand how to not retreat from these important conversations, but to actually go deeper and become more committed. Well, Thank you. Yes. You know, we are all so grateful for everyone's participation and your commitment to racial equity and social justice. So thank you both for an amazing job. I'm so, so, so grateful that I was a part of it. So thank you all and have a good afternoon. May it not continue to rain. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank so you. Bye.